Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's begin the show with the headlines first. Pashtun protests expose human rights abuses under Pakistani visa rules. UN conference on Afghanistan faces backlash for excluding Afghan women includes Taliban for first time. And Christians in Pakistan protest against harsh blasphemy sentence against Christian man. The new visa regulations imposed by the Pakistani government have ignited significant unrest among the Pashtun community with allegations of human rights violations and severe disruptions to their daily lives. Fazalur Rahman Afridi, representing the Pashtun Tahafiz movement, brought these critical issues to the forefront during the 56th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. The international community's response to these grievances remains to be seen. We have a report. Pashtun activists are sounding the alarm over the Pakistani government's new visa regulations, which have severely impacted the lives of Pashtun people. These stringent measures imposed near the border areas and along the controversial Durant line violate international law and have devastating effects on the social, economic and financial well-being of Pashtuns. The regulations have disrupted family, business and social connections on both sides of the border. In response, Pashtuns have been protesting these harsh restrictions. Fazalur Rahman Afridi, Executive Director of the Khyber Institute and a representative of the Pashtun Tahafuz Movement or PTM, raised these concerns during the 56th session of the UN Human Rights Council. For the last eight months, uh, the Pashtuns are protesting against the strict visa regulations of the government of Pakistan, which is in violation of the international law because the people living in the vicinity, in the border areas, and especially the Durin line is controversial uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan. So the people living there, they have families on both sides of the Durin line. They have their businesses, they have social and economic connections with each other. The Pakistani government and military have responded violently to these peaceful protests. Over 200 Pashtun leaders have been forcibly disappeared and more than 100 people have been injured during the demonstrations. For that, for the last month, the Pashtuns are protesting and have organized a sit-in in Chaman. But instead of listening to the grievances of the Pashtun people, especially the PTM, the Pakistani government and its military is attacking the protesters, attacking the citizen. They have systematically several times uh, attacked this citizen. And recently, they again attacked this citizen. They killed an, uh, uh, a 15 years old young boy. The new visa requirements have left hundreds of Pashtuns encamped outside the Friendship Gate, the authorized border crossing between Chaman and the Afghan district of Spinboldak, protesting the one-document regime. Additionally, the Pakistani military has been accused of extrajudicial killings and targeting innocent civilians under the guise of operations against the Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan and Al-Qaeda. Afridi called on the international community particularly the United Nations, to protect the basic fundamental rights of the Pashtun people. He accused the Pakistani military of gross human rights violations against various ethnic minorities, including the Baloch, Sindhis and Kashmiris. हजार हमारे शॉप्स और मार्केट्स को तबाह किया है और 80,000 पश्तूनों को इन्होंने 
قتل کیا ہے جو ان کا ضرب غضب اور ضرب اعظب آپریشن تھا جو انہوں نے کنڈکٹ کیا اور اس کے خلاف ہم اٹھے اس کو انٹرنیشنل لیول پہ ہم نے اٹھایا ریسنٹلی اگین انہوں نے ٹی ٹی پی کے ساتھ اگین پاکستان کی آرمی نے معاہدہ کیا ٹی ٹی پی کے پچیس ہزار ان کے لیڈرز کو ان کی فیملیز کو ان کو ری سیٹل کیا پختونخوا میں The human rights activist also highlighted that Pakistan's economy is driven by conflict, either waging war inside the country or continuing proxy wars against others. This is the genocide since 20 years of Pashtuno. It will be added to it. We, the international community, and the international community, the regional powers, to inform us that we will interfere. Last year, Pakistan decided that only those with valid passports and visas could cross the Chaman border. Previously, both Pakistanis and Afghans could cross using their respective identity cards. The situation remains dire and activists continue to raise awareness about these human rights abuses. As the protests continue, the call for international attention and intervention grows louder. The question is, will the world listen? Minorities in Pakistan have been suffering due to draconian blasphemy laws, which are frequently misused to target them on false allegations. These laws, rather than protecting the vulnerable, have become tools of oppression, leading to grave consequences for religious minorities. Recently, dozens from Pakistan's Christian community rallied in the streets of Karachi against the death sentence given to a Christian man convicted of blasphemy. The protest, organized by the Christian community and civil society, highlighted ongoing tensions and the urgent need for justice and minority rights in Pakistan. Dozens of civil society members in Pakistan's Karachi protested the death sentence given to a Christian man on blasphemy charges. Several Christians joined the rally, marking nearly a year since a major mob attack on Christians in Pakistan. The protest follows a Sahiwal court's verdict sentencing Ehsan Shan Masih to death for sharing hateful content against Muslims on social media. The protest organized by the Christian community, Minority Rights March and civil society groups took place outside Karachi Press Club to draw attention to the increasing persecution of religious minorities in Pakistan. ये जो शान मसीह साहिवाल एंटी टेररिज्म कोस्ट में उसको सुधाए मौत सुनाई है इस फैसले से हम मुतमिन नहीं हैं और ना सिर्फ पाकिस्तान की सारी अकलीयतें बल्कि मसीही जहां जहां आबाद हैं उन तक ये फैसला पहुंचा है उन्होंने सुधाए एहतजाज बुलंद किया The controversy began when on 16 August 2023 26 churches and hundreds of homes were torched in Jaranwala, Faisalabad district after two local Christian men were accused of desecrating pages of the Quran and writing a letter with blasphemous content. This triggered outrage among Muslims who attacked churches and Christian homes. Ehsan Masih, a 22-year-old man from Sahiwal district, North Jaranwala, posted the letter that sparked the violence on his TikTok account. Amir Farooq, a Muslim who now serves as a police officer, downloaded it and filed a complaint under Pakistan's blasphemy rules. Anti-terrorism court special judge Ziaullah Khan found Ehsan guilty of blasphemy, sentencing him to death, as well as 22 years in prison and a fine of 1 million rupees for other offenses. Dushan was not party to the desecration. He was accused of reposting the defaced pages of the Quran on his TikTok account. Demand Hamari, Sadre Pakistan, Supreme Court of Pakistan, Army Chief, and Vasidas and Pakistan say, 
कि इस बच्चे को फौरी तौर पर इंसाफ दिया जाए इस केस को फिर फौर खत्म किया जाए और जिन लोगों ने दर हकीकत जड़ा वाला में तबाहकारी की मजहबी दहशत गर्दी की उनको वाकई सजा दी जाए माइनॉरिटीज इन पाकिस्तान हैव बीन सफरिंग ड्यू टू ड्रास्टिक ब्लैसफेमी लॉज व्हिच हैव लॉन्ग बीन अ सोर्स ऑफ कंट्रोवर्सी विद क्रिटिक्स आर गोइंग दे आर ऑफन मिसयूज्ड टू सेटल पर्सनल स्कोर्स एंड टारगेट माइनॉरिटीज द ह्यूमन राइट्स कमीशन ऑफ पाकिस्तान इन इट्स लेटेस्ट एनुअल रिपोर्ट मेंशन द जनावाला मॉब अटैक एंड स्ट्रेस्ड दैट वायलेंस इन द नेम ऑफ रिलीजन हैज इंक्रीसिंगली बिकम द स्टेटस को इन पाकिस्तान Moreover in its report HRCP has expressed concern over the potential for increased abuse following recent legislative changes that disproportionately affect minority groups such as Ahmadis Christians and Shia Muslims Just last month in June in Pakistan's eastern Punjab province Sargodha city a Christian man named Nazir Masi was brutally attacked by an angry mob over suspicions of blasphemy police officials reported that masih was accused of desecrating the quran the surge in sectarian violence has prompted several countries including the us the uk and canada to caution their citizens against traveling to pakistan this advisory adds to the existing travel restrictions due to terrorism and other conflicts further emphasizing the country's security challenges Until significant reforms are made the threat of blasphemy related violence will continue to overshadow the lives of Pakistan's religious minorities hindering their hopes for a safer more inclusive future In Qatar's Doha a pivotal United Nations conference was held to address Afghanistan's critical issues marking the first such meeting to include the Taliban since they take over in 2021 Despite the goal of fostering engagement the conference faced backlash for excluding Afghan women and civil society representatives This exclusion has sparked protests and criticism highlighting the ongoing deterioration of women's rights in Afghanistan Our report delves into the details In Doha, Qatar, a two-day United Nations conference was held to address Afghanistan's pressing issues. This meeting, attended by envoys from approximately 25 countries, was the third such conference in the Gulf nation, but the first to include the Taliban. Since taking power in August 2021, Following the withdrawal of US led forces after two decades of conflict the Taliban has not been internationally recognized The purpose of this meeting was to foster engagement with the Taliban without implying recognition of their government Recognition is for member states it is not for the United Nations Uh, we are an international organization we have 193 members but it is their decision on whether they recognize a government or not not ours well, what we are doing is facilitating uh, the interest of a, quite a number of countries in the international community who feel that engagement with afghanistan principled engagement um will be to the benefit of the afghan people its neighbors and the international community In May 2023, the Taliban declined to join the first Doha hosted meeting, citing unmet demands, including the recognition of its emirate and assurances against criticism of its governance. By the second meeting in February this year, the Taliban claimed their invitation was sent too late, while the UN's chief Antonio Guterres pointed out the group's unacceptable conditions. such as excluding afghan civil society members from the talks this recent meeting aimed to advance international engagement on afghanistan and engage the taliban in discussions on improving the lives of millions of afghans particularly concerning women's rights which have deteriorated since the taliban returned to power 
running through all the discussions was the deep international concern from special envoys and for me about the ongoing and serious restrictions on women and girls. Afghanistan cannot return to the international fold or fully develop economically and socially if it is deprived of the contributions and potential of half its population. We also discuss the need for more inclusive governance and respect for the rights of minorities. This UN-led meeting has faced backlash from Afghan women and human rights group for not including Afghan women in the discussions. Women from Afghanistan protested and voiced their criticism of this exclusion. UN officials conceded to the Taliban's terms to ensure their participation, which included excluding civil society representation. The agenda also omitted discussions on women's rights, a critical issue for meaningful international engagement with the extremist group. This decision by the United Nations to hold the Doha 3 meeting without an agenda item on human rights or women's rights and without Afghan women being invited as participants is a, is a shocking decision and it's one that will have major and long-term harmful effects. Um, obviously, it will affect the credibility of the United Nations on Afghanistan, the relationship between the United Nations and Afghan civil society, um, but it will have global implications as well. Security Council Resolution 1325, which is the resolution that says that women have a right to be full participants in all important discussions about their country's future, has been around for 25 years. It's a it's a foundation of the the international approach to women's rights. It's it's fundamental. You know, if women aren't at the table, then they can't protect all of their other rights. Um, and we have always looked to the UN to uphold Resolution 1325. The UN's um, performance in doing that has been very imperfect. Um, but this is really a, a new low and and a bit of an existential crisis. Since taking power in August 2021, the Taliban has reversed the progress made over the past two decades regarding women's rights in the country. Currently, women and girls in Afghanistan face numerous human rights abuses systematically enforced through over 100 degrees targeting their rights to work, attend school, access health care, engage in political or public life, or even visits parks, restaurants, or beauty salons. Afghanistan is the only country to institutionalize such policies. Women have effectively become prisoners in their own homes with male relatives acting as their jailers. This has resulted in a widespread mental health crisis and a humanitarian emergency. Afghanistan's economy is in free fall and levels of poverty and food insecurity are skyrocketing as half the population is barred from contributing their skills and labor to the country's recovery. Terror camps in Pakistan continue to serve as breeding ground for terrorists where they are trained in warfare tactics and equipped for incursions into India. These camps, doubling as logistical hubs, pose a grave security challenge as trained terrorists infiltrate into Jammu and Kashmir, often under the cover of darkness and adverse conditions. India's response has been robust, employing advanced surveillance technologies to monitor infiltration routes along the line of control. Terror camps in Pakistan serve as training grounds and bases for various terrorist organizations. These camps train militants in tactics such as guerrilla warfare, bomb making and weapons handling, doubling as logistical hubs for planning and coordinating terrorist activities across the region. Infiltration from these camps into India's Jammu and Kashmir remains a long-standing issue with trained terrorists crossing the line of control to carry out attacks or support local insurgencies. 
Infiltration routes are carefully planned, often involving crossing difficult terrain under the cover of darkness or adverse weather conditions to avoid detection by Indian security forces. The presence of these camps and ongoing infiltration pose significant security challenges for India, fueling insurgency and terrorism in the region. Pakistan provides logistical support, including weapons, ammunition and communication equipment to facilitate operations of these terrorist groups. This support ensures that terrorists have the necessary resources to carry out attacks and sustain prolonged engagements with Indian security forces. Indian security forces, however, are actively engaged in tackling the challenge of infiltration, employing advanced surveillance technologies such as thermal imaging, drones, and border fencing to monitor infiltration routes along the line of control. कैंपें हैं टेरर फैक्ट्रीज हैं ये जो ऑर्गेनाइजेशन से हैं वो वहां पे ऑपरेट करते हैं और उनका दुकान उनकी कमाई और उनकी बिजनेस मॉडल इसी पर चलता है कि क्या हम अंदर डाल के खून खराबा कर पा रहे हैं अगर वो नहीं कर पा रहे हैं उनको भी वहां पे पैसा मिलना बंद हो जाता है उनको तरह तरह से जो पैसा मिलता है जगह जगह से उनकी बिजनेसेस में उनको अपनी सरकार से और दूसरे जरिए से जो मिलता है वो भी बंद हो जाता है Terrorist groups backed by Pakistan employ various tactics to undermine communal harmony, often resorting to selective attacks aimed at provoking retaliation and exacerbating religious divisions. Recent incidents have shown targeted violence against Hindu-majority areas in Jammu, intending not only to cause physical harm, but also to foster mistrust and incite communal tensions. The terrorist attack in Riyasi on June 9 resulted in the loss of several lives, exemplifying such efforts to disrupt peace and stability in the region. These actions create an atmosphere of fear and hostility, undermining efforts towards peaceful coexistence among communities. In Jammu side, they are trying to do this primarily because they want to make it communal because they know that there is composite population mile jule log rehte hain wahan pe to wo usko khalal paane ke liye isko karna matlab unko us pe zor dete hain haar bhi rahe hain kyunki kar nahi pate dangri hua par dono community ne milke usko wo kara response kara ki ye terror act hai it is not an act of hindu versus muslim it is an act of terrorists who have no qualms unka koi dushmani nahi hai wo jo 4 5 6 7 8 10 logo ke isme bachcha bhi ek mar gaya koi so this is a pure act of terror where no muslim no islam is ever supporting it so even the hindu community has accordingly prevented it from you know becoming communal that is our core strength i believe the police force which is also equally composite and is guarded and is armed with not only arms and ammunition but with public faith Pakistan's strategy of using infiltration as a means to achieve its objectives against India has proven futile and counterproductive, leading to significant repercussions both internally and internationally due to terrorism. Despite decades of supporting and facilitating infiltration into Kashmir, Pakistan has not succeeded in altering the status quo or achieving its political goals. Instead, Pakistan finds itself grappling with the adverse consequences of terrorism within its own borders. Pakistan's involvement in supporting terrorism has led to international condemnation and isolation. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia.